Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining this webcast today. Um, as we wait for get started, we, we greatly appreciate if you would fill out the quick poll uh, about whether your team has been affected by a data breach or not. It's on the right side of the window. There's a section that says poll. Just take a minute to fill that out, uh, and then we will continue. Awesome. See some entries coming in. So today we will be covering some best practices for strengthening the security posture of uh, your DevOps setup. Uh, we say five best practices, but uh, you know, in essence, there could be more than five. Personally, I believe in, in keeping it simple, uh, actionable and manageable. Uh, so that if there is even one thing you take away from this session, it can really help improve your overall DevSecOps process and security posture. So moving along here, uh, a quick introduction to your hosts. We have Max Bauer, who is the product manager for Bitwarden Secrets Manager. Uh, and I'm Nasser Khan, the product and developer marketer for our developer-centric offering, including Secrets Manager uh, and Passwordless Dev. A quick run up of our agenda. We will be touching on a few security best practices that we have observed in the space that can enhance your DevOps security. Uh, Max will then walk you down a demo of the Bitwarden Secrets Manager and we will leave some time for uh, Q&A. Uh, some quick house rules, feel free to post uh, questions in the chat area and we will try to answer them as we go. Uh, we will also have some time in the end for, for Q&A. So from the poll we ran, it seems like 70% of uh, respondents mentioned that they had been affected by a data breach. And interestingly, a poll from uh, Propeller Insights uh, shows that 60% of IT decision makers reported that their organization experienced uh, a cyber attack, excuse me, a cyber attack within the past year. The attacks could be increasing in frequency because of uh, issues such as misconfigurations. So simple DevOps errors like min misconf uh, misconfigured uh, AWS S3 buckets and poor password management can lead to severe security breaches. For example, uh, unsecured databases exposing sensitive information. Um, additionally, complexity in, in configurations can increase the likelihood of a misconfiguration. So attackers tend to really target um, misconfigurations, exposed credentials, and, and, and really public-facing vulnerabilities. Then there's the lack of really a well-defined shared responsibility model for security uh, beyond infrastructure, which DevOps takes care of. Who is responsible for, for, for data security? Sometimes that's undefined and, and gets unnoticed. Um, so these teams need to come together and, and, and define a well-shared uh, uh, responsi responsibility model and work on security as a joint effort. So we can attribute a lot of the you know, recent breaches due to leaked secrets, and these tend to happen either because there is unencrypted sharing of Credentials, as an example, you know, a DevOps team used an internal Slack message for rapid communication and troubleshooting. Uh, during an urgent deployment, uh, a developer might have used credentials to access the company's cloud infrastructure. Uh, uh, sorry, during deployment, a, a developer accidentally shared an unencrypted API key in, in a public Slack channel. Uh, and then within minutes, Perhaps a malicious actor who had infiltrated the, the, that Slack where, or workspace uh, was able to access those credentials and access the company's cloud infrastructure. And ultimately, they were able to extract sensitive customer data, causing uh, a major breach. And we've heard of these uh, in, in, in recent, uh, recent years. Uh, the next issue is, is hard coding of secrets, right? You, you definitely don't want to expose your secrets in, in, in source code as anyone can access them, including potential attackers. Um, additionally, you know, secrets in code can be inadvertently shared through you know, systems like Git, uh, leading to potential data breaches. Um, you know, this hard coding of secrets can also create a ma maintenance a havoc or challenge in the event that secrets need to, to be updated since uh, you know, the code may have to be redeployed, thus increasing the probability 
of outdated uh, or compromised secrets. Uh, next, with secret sprawl, this concept of too many secrets, you don't know where they are, you have uncontrolled proliferation of sensitive information such as API keys and tokens and passwords across um, various systems, repositories, environments, and apps, right, uh, across the, the enterprise. So this widespread distribution can, can really lead to several uh, challenges. For example, core secret, you know, more secrets in more places means more potential uh, points of failure and vulnerability. So, so keeping track of and updating all secrets really becomes complex uh, and error prone. So ensuring secrets meet uh, regulatory requirements um, it is much harder, uh, you know, when these secrets are scattered. Then there's this this thing of uh, you know response delays in, in case of a breach. Um, you want to be able to identify and revoke all compromised secrets uh, as fast as, as as possible, and and that process itself is very challenging and time consuming. Figuring that out, so it takes away from core work. Um, and last but not least, the, the lack of proper access management control, right? Balancing access between, you know, the humans, developers and admins and, and, and machines and applications um, really requires uh, granular control um, and, and monitoring. So, so furthermore, you know, there's this balancing act uh, between automation and, and control. For example, machines often need continuous access to secrets uh, in contrast, uh, you know, uh, with the need for strict access controls and auditing. Then there's the need for integration uh, between various systems, right? Uh, integration across systems may need to be, uh, you know, systems may need to be accessed across various platforms, uh, services and environments. Um, and again, this also requires very strict and consistent uh, management practices. Otherwise you leave gaps uh, that, that could be, uh, you know, leverage for, for an attack. So moving along with regards to secret management and, and the best practices we cover here, it, it's good to remember that the, you know, human element should always come first. And that's, that's my personal opinion, right? If you're trying to build and grow a security first uh, culture at your organization, teams need to partner up and, and share knowledge. So in this case of secrets management, the, the DevOps team might need to partner with the cybersecurity or SecOps team, or maybe they're the same team, right? If it's a smaller organization, they, they, but there really needs to be transparency in terms of what is being set up as a policy or best practice, uh, and, and it needs to be regularly, regularly uh, reviewed. Uh, you, you don't want to make uh, it rocket science, for example, uh, the, the whole process. You don't want to make it so compli uh, complicated and complex that it is jettisoned in time. Uh, the reasoning for making changes must be shared. For example, why should secrets be rotated every say, X number of days? Or why should we you know, run regular audits on machines uh, accessed uh, in a specific time frame uh, on a weekly basis? Uh, finally, automation and enforcement of policies with software uh, can, can really be a big boon for productivity as long as those tools are not uh, a major pain to set up. So with that, I want to jump to best practice number one. Uh, you want to regularly rotate your developer secrets. So why rotate developer secrets? Uh, this might seem obvious, but you really want to mitigate breach impact, right? Um, regular rotation reduces the time attackers can, can exploit compromised credentials. And as much as possible, you, you want to reduce or eliminate exposure time. And additionally, quick rotation helps contain that impact of any potential security breach. Next, you want to reduce inside the threat. So maybe those threats come from internal employees. Maybe they've moved department or, or you know, they have some access was left open. They still have access to some systems. Um, so frequent, you know, frequent changes of those secrets change, uh, to the secrets lowers the risk of, of uh, misuse by any internal uh, existing employees who might have a malicious uh, intent. Then you have former employees and things don't fall through the, you don't want things to fall uh, through the cracks during change management if they're leaving. So rotations ensure that former employees lose uh, access promptly. 
of course, you want to also integrate this with, with your internal uh, identity systems if possible, so that someone leaves the company, they don't have access to anything. Then there's this notion of compliance, right? And regulatory standards. Many regulations today mandate uh, periodic secret uh, updates. Uh, and then audits, right? Regular rotation practices help in in, in potentially passing uh, security audits, especially in security first organization and security forward organization, and really maintaining any certifications that might be in place uh, based off of uh, those audits. So, how do you determine uh, something like rotational frequency of those secrets, right? You 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 can do a risk assessment. Uh, so if you have high risk environments, you might require more frequent re uh, rotation for sensitive data and critical systems. Uh, and then you want to really assess in depth the threat landscape, uh, say within your industry, within those uh, for those systems, you want to be able to educate yourself on what's going on, right? So you want to assess potential threats and vulnerabilities uh, specific to that environment. And then you, you want to try and observe industry standards because you can learn a lot from your peers and, and standards that they've set, uh, set aside. So follow guidelines from security frameworks uh, and industry benchmarks and, and, and really learn from, from your peers. Uh, you, you can read and review things like the, the DevOps times or, or dark reading and things of that nature. And you want to really adhere to uh, specific requirements from regulatory bodies uh, or specific regulations for things like GDPR and HIPAA, and you want to make sure you conform to them. Additionally, you want to monitor usage patterns, right? What's the access frequency? You want to make sure uh, to rotate secrets more often if, if, if a system is being accessed frequently, right? Um, and then this notion of application criticality, how, uh, how critical is an application? Um, those applications might, might really require more uh, stringent rotation policies. For example, financial systems that, that store social security and credit card information and, and personal information and the like PII. And then you want to leverage automation as much as possible, right? So secret, ma secret management tools really help in this. Uh, and the, you know, the major benefit of automation is that it ensures rotations do not really disrupt workflows or development processes. And, and I see a question over here. Uh, how do you determine application criticality? Max, maybe you can take that or, or, I, or I can answer that. I, I've heard this one in the past. I mean, you can, you can do uh, a business impact analysis uh, you know, re revenue impact, right? Evaluate how, for example, the application affects revenue generation. Uh, so applications directly tied to revenue streams tend to be more critical. Operational impact, what happens if that system is down? How does it affect your operation? Is it like a severe? Or is it critical? So that takes it higher around that range. Customer impact, right? If that system is down, consider the impact on customer satisfaction and service delivery, right? And then data sensitivity. Uh, I mean, determine the sensitivity of, of, of data uh, that application handles. Uh, so applications managing sensitive or classified information tend to be more critical. And then, you know, any compliance and regulatory requirements that might be tied to the data within those systems, right? If they're, they're really like things like HIPAA, GDPR, these are critical, can hurt your business uh, and need to be maintained, that um, takes that higher along uh, uh, that ladder. So that's, those are some of the things, ways you might be able to determine application uh, criticality. Moving on, um, you know, next you, you really wanna consider implementing source code and, and binary application. And I just wanna make sure we are good on time over here. All right, I'll try and go a little faster so we can see Max's demo, but uh, you wanna like do things like source code, implement source code analysis, right? Examine source code for vulnerabilities and coding errors before compilation. This helps detect issues early on. Um, and then binary analysis, right? An analyze compile code that's already compiled to identify security threats and, and malicious code. code. And, and this really helps uh, verify security post compilation and during deployment. Uh, I recently came across an article uh, that during a routine, a routine uh, this binary analysis, a, a fintech company, uh, a de in a fintech company, this DevOps engineer discovered hard coded secrets, including database passwords and API keys in the code base. Uh, and then recognizing the security risk, the, the team was swiftly able to, to migrate them to a, a secure management system and, and catch this vulnerability in time. It could have ended in disaster. You can imagine uh, people's financial information on those systems. So what is important of source code? Uh, what's the importance of source code and binary uh, analysis specifically for you as a DevOps practitioner, right? So, you know, early detection, uh, identify vulnerabilities before uh, 
um, they're exploited. Uh, compliance, uh, in short code means security standards and, and, and regulations that might be set, set aside for, for, for your systems and your industry. And then ultimately DevOps teams want to ensure maximum security of their, their source code and, and they should be looking for looking to secure both source and compiled code, right? Uh, throughout their development pipeline. Um, and, and as much as possible, you want to incorporate source code and binary, binary lab, uh, analysis uh, as part of a standard build and release pipeline if possible, right? So what are some of the implementation strategies? I mean, you can use a SaaS, uh, you know, tools like SaaS, static application security testing tools, um, for example, a Sonar Cube or Fortify. Um, you can do binary scanning, right? You, there's tools out there like Veracode, Checkmarks, and, and, and then secret scanning, uh, GitHub secret scanning. There's another one called Truffle Hog. I don't know if it still exists, but, but there are tools that are out there. They're open source that you can utilize. Uh, point number three, never share secrets via an encrypted means. Hard coding, you know, sharing secrets via environmental uh, environment files or using secrets poses uh, a serious security risk. Uh, imagine a company, you know, that stored their database passwords in plain text uh, within their application code. You know, when a developer accidentally pushed the code uh, to a public repo, uh, repo uh, anyone could access that sensitive information, right? Uh, and this breach uh, could have been avoided by using encryption and and and, and a secure secrets management solution. Uh, you also want to use encrypted sources of truth, such as uh, a secrets manager from the get-go. So centralizing uh, secrets uh, via this means, via a, a secrets management tool, uh, reduces this risk of exposure and ensures uh, their managed security, of course make sure you, you you secure the secrets manager as well. And I'll touch on that a little later. Uh, and you want to reduce sprawl and exposure of these secrets. So, so managing secrets centrally reduces sprawl and minimizes uh, your, your surface area for potential breaches. Um, you know, consider a scenario where a company had various teams storing credentials in different places, uh, some in config files, others in scripts, and some hard-coded. Um, you know, when an attacker compromised uh, one of these sources, they gained access to multiple systems. So centralizing secrets in a, in a secure repo would, would have limited the impact of such a breach. Um, of course, secure the uh, secrets manager as well. You want to uh, additionally uh, enable programmatic access to credentials, right? So it, it makes so much sense. Just let me check on time over here. It makes so much sense um, to enable programmatic access for machine credentials securely. Um, and then you want to you know, enable secure sharing ultimately to enhance, improve developer productivity. So secure, you know, secure sharing of secrets uh, really ultimately enhances developer security and productivity. In, a lar in these large teams, right, um, often you face delays, uh, waiting for secure ways to share credentials. This not only hampers you know, the developer's productivity, it gets them frustrated. Uh, it might lead to insecure practices. You know, hey, I'm gonna email you the secret. Hey, I'm gonna put this in a Slack. Here, here it is. Or it might end up in a public channel, God forbid. So by adopting a secrets, uh, you know, secure secrets management system, de uh, you know, developers and DevOps can instantly and safely access the secrets they need. Um, in time, um, so ultimately like streamlining your workflow and, and, and boosting productivity. So again, these points should help convey the importance of using encrypted sources for secrets uh, that will help reduce security risks. So moving along next, you want to adhere to the concept of least privilege access. Least privilege access like ensures uh, users and systems are, are, are granted only the permissions necessary to perform their tasks, minimizing exposure, uh, to any critical systems or sensitive data. Again, ultimately, the, the main objective here is limit potential damage from compromised credentials or insider threats by restricting access to the minimum, absolute minimum required level. Um, how do you do this, right? How can you implement or apply the concept of, of least privileged access uh, for secrets management within Dev DevOps, right? You can apply role-based access control and in some cases, attribute-based access control. Right? Example, you know, a development team member only has access to a development environment uh, secrets, not for the not to the production system and not to production secrets. Uh, likewise, for a database developer with a certain attribute, and this is more of attribute access, right? 
um, if he's doing work in the finance department or a financial system, uh, he might you might only want them to access that financial database if they are in a specific team based out of a specific region. So you're getting really, really granular. Uh, and then secret segmentation, right? Example, API keys for different services are segmented, ensuring that each application uh, or service only accesses the keys it requires. Uh, audit and monitoring, right? You want to make sure you're regularly reviewing access logs and using monitoring tools to detect and alert uh, on unusual access patterns and anomalies. Um, and where it makes sense, you want to leverage automation. And I've touched on this multiple times, uh, automation of external secrets uh, using uh, a secrets management tool. So for example, using a secrets management tool to dynamically assign secrets based uh, on user roles and tasks, um, ensuring that the access is limited and easily audited. Um, so moving along, you already have a secrets manager in place. You want to make sure you're, you're protecting that secrets manager with at least multi-factor authentication to it there, right? So this means adding an extra layer of security beyond just a username and password. Uh, typically, 2FA requires uh, users to provide two different types of verification before gaining access to the secrets manager. Um, this could involve something the user knows like a password or, or something that they have like a code sent to their authenticator app or, or using this notion of fast keys, which are really cool in my opinion. So, so making it significantly harder for unauthorized uh, users to, to access sensitive information uh, stored within the secrets manager. Uh, you got to remember that the organization secrets are only secure as secure as, as the weakest authentication link. Um, so again, we, we covered a few best practices, uh, including rotating developer secrets, uh, performing source code and binary analysis, uh, avoiding sending secrets via an encrypted uh, means, following and implementing the principle of least privilege access, and, and, and protecting your secrets ma managed via two-factor authentication. Uh, but I'd like to add more. The, the most important thing is, is really to get your people on board. And, and this could be uh, across departments like engineering and, and security, right, uh, for example. And, and you want to build, work on building a security first culture that, that looks to implement some uh, or all of these best practices. Uh, remember that, you know, when you're implementing something, right, rules and philosophies that, that tend to get implemented follow the rule of transparency. They tend to be transparent. Uh, and they're, those rules are generally easy to follow. If you make it rocket science, it's not going to be followed. And they tend to leverage uh, a level of automation. Um, so, so now I would like to hand off to, to Max to walk us through a demo of the Bitwarden Secrets Manager. Um, actually, I have a question that just came in before that. How do you effectively segment secrets, right? Uh, let's see. So, so I, I think to effectively segment secrets, you, you can categorize by sensitivity, um, maybe group secrets based on their sensitivity level, such as whether they're public, internal systems, confidential, or restricted, uh, maybe segregate based off of their functionality, organize secrets by the application type, environment, is it developer, is it testing, is it production? and user roles, right? Who's accessing is it a tester, is it a production level developer, or what is it, right? Who is it? Uh, use access controls, right? Implement strict access controls, uh, ensure only authorized users can, can access, uh, access specific secrets, uh, and continually monitor and audit, right? Re regularly review access logs uh, and, and audit trails to ensure compliance and, and, and uh, detect any unauthorized access. And with that, uh, Max, over to you. Thank you, everybody. Not working. Wonderful. Bitwarden Secrets Manager is a easy solution to store, manage, automate, and share secrets at scale. I'm going to do a um, product walkthrough. Feel free to drop your questions in the chat um, whenever there's something unclear. Nasser, I'll kindly ask you to interrupt me whenever there's a question popping up um, because I won't be That's able good. to see both screens. Um, Let's make sure you're able to share I'll it first. Take over the screen sharing. I think I it should yeah. be working. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Great. So not unlikely some of you are already using password manager. 
um, Secrets Manager integrates seamlessly into Password Manager and we have our product switcher here, which makes it super easy to switch between both products or also organizations. Upon first logging, a user sees all of the projects and secrets they can access, same as in Password Manager, where we have collections, we're grouping a bunch of secrets together in projects. A project could be, for instance, a specific application, it could be a specific repository, it could be a specific CI CD pipeline or Kubernetes namespace. It really depends on how you want to structure and organize your secrets. But each project would typically consist out of multiple secrets. And each secret is a name and value. And in addition, you can leave a note. Um, one of the things that makes Bitwarden Secrets Manager unique um, in contrast to the vast majority of other um, secrets managers is that we are fully end-to-end -end encrypted and we have a zero knowledge architecture. That means that we have no access to any of the information you're storing within Secrets Manager and every field provides the same level of um, security. So in theory, you could also use the notes field to store additional um, super confidential information as it provides exactly the same security as the value field. For each project, we can assign people or we can assign groups. So we could, for instance, assign like this is a bit generic now and in a more realistic scenario, we would probably have a more granular group, but we could add our DevOps team and we can differentiate between can read and write access. So if we want them to only be able to access secrets and retrieve secrets, we would assign can read access if we want folks to be also be able to um, create secrets, rotate secrets up and so on we would pro, um, provide them also right access. And in kind of the same manner as we have um, human users, people, we have machine users. The machine users are CI CD pipelines, for instance, or it could be your local CLI. Um, it could be the Kubernetes operator, pretty much any machine that is automatically accessing um, Secrets Manager would get its own machine account. And again, here we can differentiate between can read and write. So if we, just have a simple GitHub Actions pipeline, we would most likely only want to provide it um, read access. If we have something that also automatically rotates secrets, we would also provide write access. On the secrets tab, we just see all of the secrets we can access as a developer. And here on the machine accounts, we get an overview of all machine accounts we can access. A machine account can access one or multiple projects. Um, a very typical scenario would be that you have like one base project with um, environment variables that are shared by all your pipelines or all of your machines. And then you have specific um, secrets that should only be accessed by, by that machine. Overall, um, as Nasser mentioned before, we, we highly recommend to follow the principle of least privilege. So no matter your setup, the, the machine or the user only gets access to the things they absolutely need. We can also manage who can manage the machines. So we always have a human user or at least one human user who can, who stays the uh, master of the machines. Um, we can also assign groups, of course. Those are the folks who can assign the machine account to new projects um, and create new access tokens. The access tokens are one-time generated um, decryption keys. Those are generated client side. Um, so again, here we never have access to, to any of them and they're only shown once. Um, it can give it a name and we can set an expiry date. So it can be either one of the predefined ones or we can also set a custom expiry date. I'm just gonna set it to seven days. And we get our access token um, and can copy it. For each machine, we also provide event logs. So any access operation by that machine, we display the event logs directly under the machine account. This makes it quite easy to see what that specific machine is doing. It also um, may potentially helps with debugging if a pipeline is not working as expected. Um, with in our admin console. So in our admin console and reporting, we show the event logs for all um, interactions, one for the machine accounts, but we can also, for instance, see me logging in as, as a human user and so on. And all of these event logs can be uh, integrated in a wide range of CM tools. We provide them either using our REST API or we have a couple of pre-built ready-made integrations as well. For Secrets Manager overall, um, we have a bunch of um, ready-made integrations as well. One item that is not listed here, but that is going into GA 
um, just next week is our Kubernetes operator. Um, so GitHub Actions, GitLab CI, CD, Ansible, um, as well as our SDKs. So we support pretty much all commonly used development languages. I'm just going to switch over to share an example of the Python SDK. Uh, I think. Wonderful. Um, so this would be an example of using our Python SDK. Basically what we're doing is we're just installing the SDK, um, simply using pip install Bitwarden SDK. And then we can specify a couple of things such as the device type, the base URL. Um, for instance, in the case you're a self-hosting secrets manager, um, you would have to specify a custom base URL, or if you're using the EU instance of Bitwarden, you would have to specify the base URL. By default, we're just using the, uh, the .com instance. And um, then we need to specify our access token, which we retrieved earlier for, for that specific machine account. And then we can, like in, in this example, we just have like one of the most straightforward examples, which is retrieving secrets by UUID. So we have our secrets and we have our UUID. And the SDKs make it super simple to replace like existing setups. Let's say, for instance, you're using ENV files, super easy to migrate, or worst case, you're using um, hard-coded credentials, also makes it fairly easy because essentially you're just switching out hard-coded credentials with secret UUIDs. Max, do you think you can magnify the code screen a little bit? It's it's yeah. very high. Yeah. Uh, right. It's, it's highly pixelated. Can't see much. Maybe like this. That's a little better, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Now, if we just run this, um, Uh, we're already running it here. We get our page, and then we would be able to see that again in the event logs, um, all of the secrets retrieved. We'll just navigate back to the event logs. I'm sorry, sharing screen here in, in this tool in Hubilo is a bit of a a bit of a pain. You have to click so many clicks here. Mm. And going back to the event logs. So here um, we see like the, the latest secrets retrieved. Um, on top of that, not like the most sophisticated or special function, we of course also have our trash. So in case you accidentally delete secrets, they're stored for 30 additional days. Um, you can permanently delete them um, immediately. Uh, yeah, and that brings me to an end for the secrets manager demo. Are there any questions? I, I don't see any any questions yet. We can give people a few minutes to process. Thanks, Max, for that demo. And with that, we have come to an end of this webcast session. I implore you to try Bitwarden Secrets Manager for free uh, for seven days at bitwarden.com uh, slash secrets dash manager dash trial. Have a good day.